between ISIS and Ebola, the news is very disconcerting, and you get the feeling the world could easily unravel. It's a little uncreative to relegate Armageddon to these two narrow realms, so tonight we thought we'd widen the net just a little bit to find all the ways the world could possibly end. How prepared are you for an alien invasion? What about a mid-stratospheric nuclear strike that melts our power grid? How quickly could a financial collapse spell the end of society as we know it? We'll spell it all out for you tonight, giving you a buffet of destruction to choose from. Apocalypse. How? This is The Independence. Hello there, I'm your hostess, Kennedy. Very glad you've joined us for the beginning of your awesome weekend. And I'm joined by my skeptical stalwart. It's Reason Magazine editor-in-chief Matt Welch. And a man who loves poking holes in anyone's hysteria, Camille Foster from Free Think Media. And together we are the Independents. As Gen Xers, we were raised under the umbrella of imminent nuclear holocaust. No wonder we grew up in mild apathy. And maybe it's from taking in too many images of total destruction like this. <laughs> The mushroom cloud makes me crave antipasto. So while we're still waiting for our red dawn, the president tried to assure us it's not the Russians we have to fear. He put it rather bluntly in March. I continue to be much more concerned when it comes to our security with the prospect of uh, a nuclear weapon going off in Manhattan. He's the president, and surely he reads his intel reports. What does he know about a dirty bomb in New York? That's horrible. And what should we fear more, fissile material in the hands of hateful jihadists or all-out nuclear war with Russia? Let's ask our party panel. We've got a couple of thoughtful heavyweights tonight on the panel. KT McFarlane is Fox News national security analyst. And we've got Ambassador James Woolsey. He joins us from Washington. He's a national security and energy specialist and former director of the CIA. So let's tackle ISIS and fissile funk first. How likely is it that someone with a bone to pick and an axe to grind could get enough at atomic material together to really do some damage to a big city and the homeland? Ambassador Woolsey, I'll turn to you first. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Good to be with you. Uh, I'd say uh, a few months, uh, because uh, when uranium is being enriched, uh, when you've, let's say, enriched it to a level of 20 percent, you've done about 90 percent of the work you need to do in order to have material that is fissile and uh, can be uh, used in an explosion. And the design of a nuclear weapon, if you're not going to do something sophisticated with it, if you're just going to blow it up, uh, can be very, very simple. Uh, so uh, if you are concerned about, uh, and I think we should be, uh, a rogue state such as uh, Iran uh, in a year or two, uh, being able to launch a simple ballistic missile with a simple nuclear weapon up uh, uh, above the stratosphere over the United States, uh, that could, as you said in your introduction, be something that would fry uh, our, most of our uh, electric grid. And then we're living uh, not in the 1990s pre-web, but in the uh, uh, 1890s pre-electricity. And very few of us have enough uh, water pump handles and plow horses. And we're going to talk to you a little later in the show about uh, some EMPs and stuff like that. So what's more likely, if we're talking about a nuclear event, what is more likely, a dirty bomb in the hands of ISIS or some other jihadist group? Because now we know with recent strikes in Syria, there are many more groups at the ready who are hell-bent on not only is Israel's destruction, but ours as well. So what is more likely, a dirty bomb or a nuclear war? KT, I will go to you. You're not as concerned about the dirty bomb scenario why? Well, I want to say that, first of all, when I used to teach a course at MIT on strategic nuclear forces, nuclear weapons, that was a more dangerous period because we didn't really know what the other guys were doing. We knew that they had plenty of nuclear weapons, we had plenty of nuclear weapons, and we had had crises in the past, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think we're not there now. And in fact, this is an oddly safer time because we don't have the Soviet Union deciding it's going to 
go on nuclear alert, um, DEFCON 2 for the United States. But I do worry that going forward, sort of two or three or four years down the road, then we have a more serious problem because as Iran potentially gets nuclear weapons, as there's more fissile material introduced, particularly in the Middle East, that that ends up falling into the hands of these subnational transnational groups, countries which aren't even countries, groups which don't worry about somebody coming to get them after the fact. They think it's just part of the game. That's terrific for suicide bombers. So that's what I worry about is the combination of suicide bombers yeah. and nuclear devices. And okay, and the fissile material now, Ambassador, I want to ask you quickly uh, before the gentleman step into the fray, what about our own nuclear arsenal that is in ill repair? I mean, it's some of it is poorly guarded and in bad condition. Is that ripe for the picture? For, for people who want us to die? Well, uh, the degree of uh, uh, rust on the, the nuclear weapons uh, probably doesn't have a great deal of effect on whether or not uh, someone would try to grab one and use it. They'd be much more constrained by figuring out how to detonate it, uh, where to put it, and, and so on. Just to follow up on KT's point about deterrence, you were part of the Rumsfeld Commission back in the 19, late 1990s yeah. that was talking about the threat of ballistic missiles of rogue state. And there's a lot of language back there about North Korea being five years away and Iraq being being 10 years away. Was that report prescient? Was it alarmist at the time? And more importantly, does the deterrent factor work uh, against states that actually have to control borders? I, uh, I think it was a good report. I think Don did a good job sharing it, and uh, we all worked uh, fairly uh, hard on it. Uh, the problem with relying on something from that era is uh, something that Bernard Lewis has said. He said, back in the Cold War, uh, we uh, thought of uh, mutual assured destruction as a deterrent. The problem is now for some countries it's an inducement. Uh, if uh, the leadership of Iran believes what some of them say, and they would just as soon die and have us die, and we go to hell and they go to heaven from their point of view, and it's all over, uh, that's a very different kind of threat than uh, Russian bureaucrats and military officers. Uh, I'd written, negotiated with those guys four times, and they didn't want to die for the principle of each according to his ability to each according to his need. They wanted to remodel their dodges. All right, and uh, KT, let's let's get into the the nuclear threat with Russia. Obviously, the president has ratcheted up his rhetoric uh, on the Russia in regards to Ukraine. You know, they're making some very bold moves. What would it take to draw the U.S. into a conflict with Russia, and how soon before it goes nuclear? Well, um, the conflict with Russia, United States, Russia, that would be only under the context of say a NATO treaty, where the Russians invade a NATO member state, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and then all the NATO countries. Countries respond. There's something called Article 5 in the NATO Treaty, which I call the Three Musketeers Article, all for one, one for all. That would be the only response you could see. Now, the question of how soon it would go nuclear, you know, that's always been a debate. Would big countries with nuclear weapons, if they start fighting each other, even on a little border, would it immediately escalate to thermonuclear war? I wrote my dissertation on that, and no, I think that the one example we've had is China. And Russia, China, the Soviet Union, 1969, they did fight each other, but it didn't escalate to nuclear war. And uh, Ambassador, I'll ask you the same question. What would it take to uh, escalate it? I think one dangerous thing that is happening is that the Russians are building uh, small, uh, easily hidden uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, that uh, uh, they might be tempted to use something small in a terrible crisis much more than they would be tempted to uh, uh, use a very large weapon to wipe out a whole part of the United States, for example. Uh, I think they are making it uh, easier on themselves and also uh, relying on nuclear weapons uh, is a lot cheaper than uh, building a adequate military force. The Russians uh, are, don't have an economy that can do anything except really produce oil and some gas. And uh, they're hurting for money uh, because of the, the price of oil and so forth these days. I think they are uh, uh, in a situation uh, where they could be tempted to rely much more heavily on nuclear weapons because it's more cost effective from their point of view I mean, I wonder, uh, than to rely on conventional forces. I wonder, Casey, do you share that, that, that uh, belief that Russia might actually use nuclear weapons Look, unilaterally or preemptively on a smaller scale? Here's the one that keeps me up at night. 
it's Pakistan, an unstable country with a, supposedly a democracy, but a, and, it, and it's a country that has a very large jihadist, rebel, you know, Taliban, Al Qaeda-like group within it, and it has 90 to 100 nuclear weapons. How secure are those nuclear weapons? To me, the big nightmare when you're talking nuclear is terrorists, nuclear weapons, or fissile material. How do the two get together? Yeah. I don't think they're going to happen in Moscow. So, so I think Pakistan, it's far more likely in Pakistan. Pakistan concerns you more than North Korea? Um, North Korea, I, what concerns me most about North Korea, I don't think they wake up and decide, let's go nuke San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more likely that they say, what are we going to sell? We got nukes, we yeah. got missiles, let's sell them to some bad actor who's got a lot of extra change in his pocket. That's the one that worries me. They got me more nuclear. bad actors than every round of Sharknado. Well, uh, KT and Ambassador Woolsey, thank you very much. Ambassador, we'll see you later in the show. All right, we've tackled nukes, and now it seems all too easy for a sweaty Liberian to hop on a plane for JFK and infect us all with Ebola. Is this superbug mostly hype? And if it's not crashing and bleeding, which microbe threatens to end life as we know it? Apocalypse How continues, but first, how do you think it'll end?